Category theory is uh, uh, unabashedly one of my top three or four loves in life. And uh, I'm not going <laughs> to cause you to speculate on, on what the others are, but um, the, uh, the topic has uh, caught my imagination like, um, uh, like a few other things that I've encountered in my career, enough so that I am essentially betting the next uh, phase of my career around um, um, uh, building on uh, ideas of applied category theory um, to what I believe will be great effect um, to uh, to enhance the uh, what we can accomplish within the computational epidemiology public health informatics lab. Um, it, it also is a topic of uh, of of just uh, uh, remarkable and sublime um, beauty, uh, depth, um, usefulness. And um, I hope to convey some of those other qualities to you uh, while coaxing you along and, 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 um, and encouraging you to stay on what will be a challenging journey um, for you as it has been for me. Um, uh, category theory um, is a topic that many of my faculty within the department um, um, have events surprise that I am um, diving into it. Um, they consider me a, a very applied person and um, category theory for them is kind of sort of the outer outskirts of um, theoretical uh, computer science slash math. Um, and uh, they've uh, expressed surprise that I'm, um, uh, that I'm investing so much in this area. Um, Many of my foremost modeling colleagues worldwide, uh, I think, will be equally surprised. And some, uh, many have indicated they, they've never heard the term, so they're not sure what in the world it is. Um, uh, it is not a topic which has um, uh, achieved enormous currency in the social surrounds uh, of Cephal. Um, uh, but it is a topic that I believe should achieve that currency. Uh, for many reasons that are near and dear to Cephal's mission um, and uh, which um, live close to my heart. Um, category theory is a topic um, which is um, large, deep, um, can be forbiddingly taught in a forbiddingly abstract way, um, but, um, but is fundamentally uh, very useful in its implications and profound in its um, in its implications for for other areas of computer science, um, such as um, uh, those associated with topics like functional programming, language design, um, uh, applications of computer science in the system science area, and I'll I'll touch on some of these linkages. But I I, I first wanted to talk about a couple key themes in category theory, um, which uh, are kind of overarching um, uh, uh, overarching uh, elements to which you keep on coming back as your knowledge deepens. Um, uh, you know, category theory, um, in a sense, is all about structure and understanding of structure, but it's about an understanding of structure in context, in, in terms of relationships. And you can argue that in some levels it's about the relationship of the whole to the parts um, in a way that aligns it with much of system science. And you'll find me occasionally um, arguing that category theory is the missing pillar of, of uh, system science that is, is currently absent from, from the intellectual discussions of that discipline. Um, but category theory is more specific than hand wavy in these regards. Um, it um, focuses a tremendous amount of its uh, emphasis and indeed power on understanding of and securing, um, securing um, usefulness out of compositionality, our ability to, to compose um, uh, things that, that, that we know, maybe it's functions from A to B and from B to C into you know, a, a, a function from, from A to C. Um, 
These could be functions, these could be uh, links in a graph, uh, these could be uh, relations, like uh, A is less than B and B is less than C. Um, these could be um, functors um, between, uh, between categories. And this compositionality um, turns out to be uh, extraordinarily um, powerful in its implications if you consistently apply that. And it's quite central to the notion of a category, as we'll see in the opening lectures, uh, probably after lecture three or four. Um, the very notion of a category um, uh, assumes um, uh, as an axiom that um, uh, the category, for something to be a category, it needs to um, needs to have this proper uh, this property of, of compositionality. If if you have A to B and B to C in it, uh, you will have a an A to C. Um, and it turns out to be surprisingly subtle. And you may be jarred into an, uh, a certain complacency that you understand what compositionality is, only to be to find yourself confused when you come to something like Kleisley categories where instead of being a convenient function A to B and another function B to C that compose in an obvious way, you instead have something like um, uh, A to uh, some monoid, uh, excuse me, some mona, monad uh, M uh, B, and, um, and then from B to some, the same monad uh, C. And you can compose them into something from A to, A to uh, that monad uh, C, uh, where, where A and C are types. Um, so that monad could be something uh, as simple as a uh, uh, as a list, for example, or a maybe monad, or it may be um, a monad that's uh, quite a bit more more uh, sophisticated, such as involving um, uh, continuations. Um, much of category theory does have to do with this notion of understanding an object from context. Um, it's almost like um, you might you might sometimes hear the truism the best way to understand a person is not to hear what they say merely but to see how they interact and, and particularly interact with others you can learn a tremendous amount about a, a person's character I've discovered over the decades be seeing how they interact not only with their day-to-day -day, uh, colleagues um, or those in their household but people from all walks of life um, you know, homeless people and, and people who are, um, who are unemployed, people who are uh, from a very different station in life. And just seeing how they interact uh, with these different groups of people can tell you a profound amount about that character of that index person. Um, if you see that same index person, A, interacting with all these other people from prime ministers down to, you know, uh, to, to, to beggars, um, you will learn something profound probably about that person's um, uh, emotional life, their beliefs, uh, their, um, their perspective on uh, what is valuable in life, etc. And so it is with category theory. We understand an object not in isolation, but based on how it relates to other objects, for example. Um, at another level, category theory is about abstraction. And it's about um, uh, abstracting features of situations in ways uh, that are insightful, but where we can relate those abstractions to other abstractions. And uh, this will get us to topics like adjunctions, where we um, uh, relate one abstraction to another through these adjoints, um, informally adjoint functors. Um, uh, there's particular aspects of this um, uh, that we see prominent in computer science, such as uh, Galois connections. But uh, abstraction here is um, a useful construct, not only in, in isolation of one abstraction, but in relating different abstractions that are in some sense compatible. Um, it's further about a synthesis and, and kind of understanding how the pieces give rise to the whole. And, and you can argue that the very notion of emergence that's so foundational within system science um, is, is very much uh, aligned with this understanding from category theory. And indeed, um, some notable uh, academic work in the past decade has, um, has come out of probing this issue of emergence from a category theoretic perspective. Um, this notion of functoriality um, 
um, of, of being able to map and lift, for example, functions to a higher level domain, um, lift a function into um, a, 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 the Kleisley category or, or lift a function uh, into a context where it can be applied uh, from from elements to instead being applied to say uh, each element of a vector. Um, that's uh, quite central to the notion of category theory. And category theory derives much of its uh, power from dealing not just with objects but with relationships between them. That's that's really what uh, so much of it is about. And the functoriality is useful because we reason about a functor applied to not objects, but, but, but the uh, mappings between them. Now, um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll further say here, and I probably should have, should have noted this with abstraction, category theory is just unbelievably powerful because it's so general. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll confide to you that I, I have some reservations about one depiction you'll sometimes hear of category theory. The category theory is math about math. It's kind of the the, the math of math. Because um, I think it scares a lot of students away. They think, well, if math is hard, you know, like category theory is going to cause my head to explode. And, and so they shy away from it. And um, I think it's a mistake um, to think about it that way. Um, and I think it... It, it risks one of the the, the worst um, uh, the worst outcomes, which can be people who sort of start a category theory and give up after a few passes and and never penetrate it in a way that's important. So, you know, if we think about you know Cephal, our lab, uh, the, the computational epidemiology public health informatics lab that some of you are part of, of which some of you are part. Um, you know, it has many themes that run throughout it, and one of them is, is system science. And, and those who will take 394, 858 ne next term will learn a lot about the systems perspective, the generative perspective. Um, but uh, I will just highlight, for those who are already familiar with it or some inkling of it, that category theory and system science I view as, as really close cousins and or at least as um, fellow travelers. Um, um, they place a huge uh, common emphasis on a lot of the things we just saw, um, and really the first bunch of uh, vitalized things are, are 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 in common. Whoa, from the previous slide here. Um, but uh, the origin of emergence, the means of naturally characterizing complex systems, um, category uh, category theory plays a role in all of those. It can lend an understanding to the natural invariance of complex systems. For example, their dimensional structure, um, how they compose with each other in a way that's at once beautiful and extremely useful and, and really, really deep in general. Um, it's, it's a means also of capturing common substructure of certain system science lenses um, in a very useful way. So, um, uh, for example, if we have a model um, that is a, a stock and flow model, and we have another version of that model that's captured within a particle filter, um, that term will be uh, familiar to some and not to others. I apologize for those terms; it's not familiar. But those people who know, uh, who do know about particle filtering of dynamic models, will recognize there's a tremendous amount of common structure there. Um, there's you know, if you know about the the model not in the particle filter, it will tell you a tremendous amount about the model in the particle filter. And if you look at the model in the particle filter, you can kind of read between the lines what the original model was. Um, there's common substructure there, and uh, and yet so much of our existing ways of building uh, these models fails to capture that common substructure. I could argue the same thing holds between a system dynamics model with stocks and flows on the one hand, an agent-based, corresponding agent-based model. There's no unique agent-based model, but each of those agent-based models that in some sense corresponds to the stock and flow model um, uh, has a certain common substructure to it. It's not the same, but there's a homomorphism between them. Um, there's a structured mapping um, that, that uh, captures certain invariants. Um, and finally, I'll say that for me, a lot of what interests me the most is that uh, category theory 
pr can provide inspiration, um, and uh, and it can uh, provide a framework uh, for um, uh, for describing complex systems. Um, uh, so it's uh, very uh, very valuable for as a sort of tool for providing APIs, I think, to build uh, descriptions of complex systems that are so much better than the existing language tools we have. So that was kind of category theory and system science. I want to see if um, if anyone else has joined us now, because, uh, yeah, it looks like we have at least uh, one more person. Okay, so that's that's uh, good. Um, I, uh, I appreciate uh, the uh, voting, people voting with their feet. Um, okay. Um, Next, uh, I want to talk about category theory and functional programming. Um, so, uh, you know, putting uh, typos aside here, um, there's profound linkages between category theory on the one hand and, and functional programming. Um, category theory uh, indeed provides much of the conceptual foundation for uh, higher level functional programming constructs uh, that we use um, uh, as a routine part of, um, of serious production level uh, functional programming today. Um, you see many of the concepts, the key concepts um, alluded to at the bottom of this, um, of this uh, slide. Um, uh, functors and factoriality have to this notion of lifting a function. You know, I have this function from ints to bools, and I can apply it to a vector of ints to get a vector of bools, right? Um, or I can um, I can have a functor uh, a, a function uh, which uh, which goes from, for example, uh, ints to doubles, and uh, I can apply it to uh, to a um, to a, a hash table, to all its contents, uh, the values in the hash table, and uh, take it from an int to a to instead a, a, a hash table of doubles, um, from a hash table of ints to a hash table of doubles. But it turns out that polymorphic functions um, are natural transformations by another name. Uh, they map, you know, for example, a um, a, a, a linked list. Into a um, into a maybe it tells you whether it was um, uh, its first first element in the linked list um, if it exists and if the list was empty it's it's nothing um, uh, it's a polymorphic function that for example might map a uh, vector into a linked list um, those are all natural transformations and um, understanding them is useful um, not least because we can create in in today's programming languages we can create uh, polymorphic functions using ad hoc polymorphism that violate in the most uh, heinous way naturality and that cause us uh, all sorts of grief when it comes to bugs so it's it's really really quite useful there um but it turns out that uh this this linkage it goes to higher levels. It goes to things like um, monads and comonads, uh, Claisley categories that support those uh, comonads. It comes to issues like free monads, uh, free applicatives, um, and applicatives uh, being a, a sort of another name for lax monoidal, or, or, or a close uh, close cousin to, to lax monoidal functors. Uh, algebraic data types and functional programming, optics, lenses, prisms, ISOs, and adapter tr transformer that have um, leaped upon the scene within the past 20 or so years in functional programming, um, uh, th they all can be traced back to category theory. Um, catamorphisms and anamorphisms, generating things in fold, folding up of lists, or using it to, to produce a stream, those are all category theoretically grounded and beautifully so, um, and even some of the notions with algebras and, and co-algebras that, that that support them. Uh, monoids, uh, which may sound like a forbiddingly um, a sort of foreign term, um, play a, a huge role in practical functional programming. You know them every time you do concat, um, uh, for example, of lists, that's a free monoid. Um, 
uh, or if you are uh, folding up um, um, a vector, uh, perhaps adding up its elements or multiplying out its elements, you're 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 applying monadic operations there. And um, but once again, we're in kind of a wild west when we do this uh, without understanding that relationship with functional programming, because we may do something that turns out to be really problematic, like we do something that is non-associative. Um, whereas with category theory, we have well-defined uh, laws that govern um, uh, monoidal operations, which if applied in functional programming will keep your code much for, you know, freer of bugs than would otherwise be the case and, and can steer you clear of, of, um, of stand traps. Um, uh, now, beyond these things, um, you know, category theory really helps uh, understand the foundations of today's functional programming landscape. It allows for formalizing patterns and functional and other programming paradigms. Uh, I'm told by, you know, uh, by wizened uh, 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 venerables in, in programming, people like Jerry, uh, Jerry Sussman, that, um, you know, they had monads back in the 1970s. They just didn't have a name for them, and they didn't know why they were so useful. And uh, it, it was, they didn't realize, perhaps, the full generality of monads. Uh, by formalizing these, by associating them with rigorous laws to be a legitimate monad, to be a legal monad, a, uh, a, um, a monad that's safe, we can um, also often generalize to um, to new contexts and, and realize opportunities for them. Um, so it turns out, for example, that um, uh, some of the structures uh, that play a role um, within functional programming end up applying over in system science. So you can think of a dynamical system as a um, as involving lenses. They're generalized lenses. They are expressed with generalized lenses in a way that's really cool. Um, you know, and, and, and thinking about things in functional programming this way allows us to build more general toolboxes, to, to characterize complex real-world structures in a functional way, in a way that's, that's really useful, and allows us to reason with greater clarity about programming challenges and structures, and avoid, uh, avoid um, you know, oversights in our design that lead to, uh, to bugs. Um, now, so those are some kind of motivations. Category theory is just, it's awesome, you know. And you may be wondering, well, okay, there's all this chocolatey goodness here. You know, there's just all this amazing, amazingly good stuff um, that, that can come out of category theory. Um, you know, how can I get some of that good stuff? And, and how can I, how can I uh, partake of that elven bread? Um, well, uh, you can. The good news is you can, and everyone on this call can take advantage of it. This is not something that you have to be, you know, an, an egg-headed genius um, to to master. This is not something that only the most um, the most ingenious mathematicians can grasp. It's not that at all. Anyone can do this sort of stuff, um, or you know, anyone who has a a, a reasonable uh, facility with with concept. Anyone in this call, absolutely. Anyone in our graduate program, yes. I mean, not, not a problem here. Um, the challenge here is that uh, category theory is notoriously difficult to break into. And I wrote those words, or I read them now with a certain degree of trepidation, because it's not just it's notoriously difficult. I'm not passing along hearsay upon hearsay here. I know it. I've lived it. And everyone else that I've dealt with and talked to about this has lived it. Uh, it's not. It's not just. Oh, I've heard people say this. No, I mean it. It is difficult to break into. Okay. Um, it takes persistence, and uh, it is possible to achieve this ready closure with respect to basic concepts. Um, and uh, and once you break into it. It's just awesome. It's unbelievably beautiful. It's unbelievably useful and deep. Um, and once you see it, once it, you've gotten to this point, it's like the puzzle is completed. 
you see how all the pieces have to be that way, have to fit together in that way. And it starts to seem straightforward, sensible, rederivable, beautiful, useful, and broad, broadly applicable. It's just this pearl. It's, it's just awesome. It's, it's incredible. The problem is that once you break into it, if it's gone too long, I think a lot of people forget um, how they got there, and, and they have trouble communicating to help others along that way. And it doesn't help that most of the people who have broken into it are, are mathematicians, many of them pure mathematicians. And so when they try to help other people, their notion of helping is, you know, appealing to core concepts in algebraic topology or, you know, referring to this, um, this relationship on diffeomorphisms or homotopy theory um, or algebraic K theory. And for those of us who are not mathematicians, um, uh, or at least are not professionally uh, mathematicians, although we might admire mathematics, um, this is really difficult because the concepts that are given out as kind of examples to help people along <laughs> are kind of, um, you know, themselves, it's like, do I, do I really want to learn um, the theory of, uh, of algebraic topology so I can understand this example to, to better understand this category theoretic concepts. Um, and, and, and it loses a lot of people. So what's required here? We got some questions. You know, what's required for people to attend this, to, to benefit from it? Do people have to have graduate mathematics? Do they have to have fourth year math courses? No, no. What I do think you should have is CMPT 260. I think, you know, you're going to want a certain amount of, of, of authentic engagement with discrete mathematics. That's, that's pretty useful. Um, uh, is it absolutely essential? No. We'll be covering a lot of those basics. We'll, we'll talk about, you know, functions and we'll talk about uh, surjections and injections some and, and epimorphisms and monomorphisms. Um, and we'll go through that together. Uh, but it is useful um, if you've encountered it before, if it's not your first time. Um, uh, so, so do you have to have classroom exposure to group theory? No. Do you have to have classroom exposure to issues having to do with, you know, algebraic topology? Absolutely not. Um, I actually think someone who is a first-year computer science student, open-minded, mathematically tolerant, and uh, eager to learn, could learn this stuff. And I... And I I, I don't exaggerate, um, but I do think what's required is some of the the, the characteristics listed here. Um, you need, arguably above all, patience and persistence. Okay. Um, I remember the first time, some of the first times I got closure on complex issues. Um, one of them as, as a young engineer, you know, learning, for example, about um, a spectral theory and, and um, fast Fourier transform or Fourier transforms and, and, and understanding the frequency domain and its dual uh, duality with the, uh, with the time domain. And, you know, it seemed almost impenetrable until you really got it and then it all made sense. And then everything could be derived from other things and it had to be that way. And, and that's what you need here, but you need it like 10 times as much. You need, you need it for 10 times as long. You need patience. You need self-driven inquiry. This is, if you come to every meeting of this alone, and that's all, it, it won't click. Okay? It, it won't click. Um, you need some, some serious effort, you know, multiple times a week. Um, and when I say serious effort, I mean, I think you're fooling yourself if you don't think you have to put in at least three hours a week outside of class time um, to, to, to really engage with the stuff and still think you'll master it. Um, uh, I, be I begin every one of my days, almost without exception, with some category theory, okay? Um, that joins my, my breakfast, 
my running and and fast walking my meditation like I, I i gotta 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 do that and and if you do that over the course of months you'll get much 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 better but it won't be overnight okay um you need a sense of self-efficacy here this this is a topic uh that will make you doubt doubt yourself it made me doubt myself and make countless other people doubt themselves you know can I, is this is this really in the cards for me? Do I really have the time for this? Is it really worth it? Um, you know, um, maybe I should just team up with someone who knows this. Stuff. L- let me tell you, it is worth it. You do have the time. You can do it. You, you you are capable, no question. But it will take persistence over months at the least, and really over a year or two for you to start feeling really comfortable. But once you get that far in, if you're really applying yourself, you'll start to develop some real understanding of it. You'll have good intuitions. It'll it'll be quite fluid for you. You can listen to talks and get a lot out of them from people who do this full time. And it's awesome. It is awesome. And you'll see all these different applications of it that are like diamonds lying on the ground that people have not are not picking up because there's so few people around to pick them up. You're in a field of diamonds. Um, uh, not, I might add, Bob Dylan's Highway of Diamonds with nobody on it. Um, so it's a sense of self-efficacy is a key key need here. You need to be confused for some time, okay? Um, you need to be confused. You need to be willing to say, look, I'm confused and that doesn't comment on my worth as a person. It doesn't comment on being, being a lesser intellect. It, it doesn't mean that I won't be able to master this. You need to be able to live with that confusion and recognize you're going to be confused the first time you see natural transformations. You're going to be confused the first time you see adjunctions. You're going to be confused about, you know, um, topics that uh, we go into with optics for some time. But you got to live with it. And you want to have a drive to whittle down that confusion. Come back to those concepts. Can I, you know, I've got a a few extra hours. Can I kind of hone in on this? Can I chip away at some of my confusion and whittle it down so that I can come to a better understanding? Um, You want to try different examples and exercises. And don't be afraid. You're going to go to something like NCAT Lab. Uh, at some point, I can tell you, don't go to NCAT Lab anytime soon. Okay, um, uh, I can I can say, don't go to Bar and Wells anytime soon. That book. Don't go to, you know, the uh, some of the canonical books in category theory immediately. Um, uh, don't go to McLean um, uh, and and try to get through his book initially. Um, uh, but you're going to stumble on these things, and you're going to be confused, and you're going to you're going to say like, oh, I don't understand what the heck that says, and you'll probably use stronger terms than that. Um, but don't give up because there's actually an amazing amount of stuff out there that's practical now, that's useful, that's exercises, that relates to things you do know. And come back to this group and share your confusion. Don't be ashamed of it. Um, I started confused. I started very confused, um, and. And, you know, now I feel extraordinarily comfortable uh, with, with things. And, and again, like, I don't, I don't worry about being confused about something because if I really put my head on, I can, I can kind of figure out what it has to be in many cases. Um, and there's enough help online now that it's, it's great. Um, you're going to need, though, to repeatedly consult many sources. Um, I told... <laughs> So we're going to be making heavy use of some resources here, like this MIT course. Folks, I have watched this, and I've watched Bartosz Milewski's course. I told told Bartosz, I think, and I told David Spivak and and Brendan Fong that I watched their courses so many times that it's really eerie for me to be around the instructors because... Normally, I know exactly what they're going to do in the next minute, um, what they're going to say, like what they're going to write on the board, the mistake they're going to make, the the uh, the sort of correction they're going to offer to something early. Because I've watched it so many times, I know 
I know, you know, oh man, they're coming up to that. Okay, uh, I, I can skip forward a few minutes. Um, I, I've like gone to these things so many times and that's what you gotta do. You gotta come back to them. And it doesn't mean you're, you know, you're, 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 you're forgetful or you're silly or you're, you're, you're dense. It's just, you gotta do it because each time you'll hear it again. Um, John Bice, who's one of the guiding lights of applied category theory, um, and an old friend of mine at Riverside, he um, he talks about spiral learning. And, you know, you get the same material at different points of the student's pro um, progression. And it's useful because you see the material again and again and again. And hopefully it's explicated at different levels of detail each time. But even if it's not, even if it's the same video, you will never view the same video in the same way again. I mean, each time you watch it, you'll probably have additional understanding. And it is very common that I'll watch some of these things, you know, three times in, in a row before I feel, okay, now I'm starting to kind of get the gist of, of what's going on really well. Um, and then pay careful attention to the explanations of those who have mastered topics. Um, I've, I've thrown out some names here. Um, uh, David Spivak and Brendan Fong. Um, uh, Emily Riel, um, uh, Eugenia Chang, uh, or Chong, um, uh, you know, these are, these are key people. Bartosz Mieluski, uh, I really admire much of his stuff. Um, and some of Richard Southwell's stuff is, is not bad either. Um, uh, you know, these, these folks that I've listed here, please review each of these and learn from them. These are folks who um, are at a very high level, and yet they've taken the time to try to boil things down into a way that's that's um, sensible and and that's explicable for people. So take the time to learn from those who have mastered uh, the topics and respect the depth of their learning and respect the fact that they took years to learn about it uh, and... Um, and that it'll take a while of exposure to really uh, give them the respect that they're due to really say you've listened carefully to it. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about some key resources. Um, I probably wouldn't be here talking with you without these resources, okay? Uh, I first encountered, I had sort of a near pass of category theory um, uh, 25 years ago. And the world was a different place then. Um, it was still cooling. No, I'm joking. Uh, but um, it um, uh, there was a lot less um, available uh, on category theory in a way that was accessible without being a mathematician. And it was tough going. It was, it was, it was extremely tough going. And I didn't I didn't think it was worth me penetrating. I was wrong. I should have. I should have penetrated it. Um, uh, I, I, I should have taken the year or two to, to do it. And I, I regret, career-wise, that I didn't do that. Mm. Now, now, there's all these resources. Particularly in the past five years, there's just been this upswelling of resources. And the MIT courses, I would, I would feature as, as, as sort of the best, the best resources out there. Like, if, if I had to give you only a couple resources, indeed, it would be these. Um, um, so, uh, these uh, course materials are structured. They are thoughtful. They are explained in a way that's fairly accessible to non-mathematicians, although there's lapsing into the mathematical vernacular that does occur. Um, the most recent course, um, which I had the privilege of attending, as did Winchell here and uh, Xiaoyun Li, um, that course involves not just uh, David Spivak and Brendan Fong, but Bartosz Mieluski as well. Um, they joined forces, and um, I'll come to their book in, in another couple minutes here. Um, but this course has a very different flavor than the previous two versions. Well, the previous two courses they offer. They're different courses. Um, the uh, course this year was much about category theory and programming. 
Now, that's really useful, and the examples are wonderful for computer scientists. Um, but our lab is also about system science, and personally, I find these other two courses just as valuable, but with a, um, a different set of deliverables, um, conceptually. Uh, these two courses in applied category theory, um, they were delivered in 2019-2018, respectively. Um, these courses um, dealt with more stuff very close to some of Seffel's needs with mathematical modeling. It's it's not all about UDE models or about agent based models or anything like that. It's um, it does hint at some things there, but it's all about understanding real world structures with category theory um, rather than predominantly programming better with category theory. Um, I oversimplify the situation, but there's a tremendous amount as modelers that uh, I think we can learn from these earlier courses that is, is kind of not explicated as well with programming with categories. But programming with categories has lots of other great stuff. So, so they're different courses. Don't think that just because you see the most recent version that it's, you know, the best version and, and it's a distillation of the others. No, it's, I would, if you were to watch two, and I've watched each one at least four times, I think. Uh, I would watch version two and programming with categories. Those are the ones that I would watch. Um, and I would watch them four times um, each. Um, and and you, will, you will gain enormously from it. Um, but we don't have to do this in isolation because we will be watching the first of them together. Um, or at least we'll be watching them and then coming to discuss them. So this is going to be the basis for um, um, for the, the meetings of this course. This will be the prime course in which we draw. It's not the only one. We'll draw some on, on some of the others. Um, but we will, uh, this will be sort of our our, our, our first point of reference, um, the, the, the 2020. Okay. Um, so this is this MIT course. Um, I believe it's going to be taught this coming year and um, I, um, if the pandemic weren't underway and the U.S. weren't under the, the sway of a madman, um, I I would think about attending it again. Um, but but that's not to be. Um, okay, um, not to be this this year, this coming year. Um, okay, additional courses. Bartosz Miluski has great stuff online. And um, his category theory for programmers one, two, three are just fantastic compendiums of, uh, of material involving um, programming examples, Haskell examples uh, in applied category theory and really good um, intuition. Uh, Bartosz um, has the distinction of being a trained in theoretical physics um, in which he he secured his PhD but also having been a programmer uh, working programmer for many years including at Microsoft and um, he uh, also has the authenticity of having um, really engaged with category theory now over the span of probably half a decade or so including going through most of McLean's um, uh, introduction, which is a very heavyweight introduction. He also is the author, like Spivak and Fong, of uh, a book, uh, in his case one book, uh, Spivak and Fong have contributed several um, on the subject. Uh, actually, Bartosz is contributing to their latest one as well. Uh, which, And all of these books are available free okay, um, for download. Um, the applied category theory community has a real commitment, which I admire, to to social betterment, um, working for the benefit of the world, um, and whether it's issues of climate change or social justice or or, or interest in um, in uh, building a, a healthier world, um, uh, they're they're uh, very much in alignment with my impulses, and maybe it's one of the reasons that I, I feel so welcomed in that world right now. Um, I do want to draw attention as well, though, to this other resource that um, some of you 
might be familiar with, might have encountered. It's, uh, it's an amazing resource. It's an older resource. I think these videos are approaching uh, a decade in age. Uh, 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 eight years, um, I think, uh, for some of them, uh, if I recall correctly. And it's the Catsters. Um, don't, don't Google the Catsters, okay? Google Catsters category theory, because otherwise you'll get all sorts of people posing posting cat videos, which, which, you know, probably at some abstract level have, have relation to category theory, uh, and we might occasionally use pictures of a cat to illustrate notions like, um, um, uh, natural transformations, but, um, but no, you want, you want the cat skirts category theory videos, um, and, uh, many of these were contributed by none other than Eugenia Chung in a earlier um, life when she was, I think, a graduate student at Cambridge University. Um, she may have done it when she was a faculty member at Sheffield. She, she is like a goddess of categories. She's awesome, awesome. And uh, she's also a concert uh, professional pianist um, and just an amaze, has this amazing ability to, to explain category theory quite well. But I have to say, these videos are more so than Bartosh's and the MIT course. They're technically dense, they're short, they're about 10 minutes, they're fast, they're fun, um, but they are very dense. And <laughs> they don't know too much on the applied side. It's, it's like <laughs> the straight stuff being dumped into your throat. Um, and <laughs> It's good. I would recommend encountering them a bit later. But meanwhile, Eugenia's more recent stuff um, is very, it, it's just, you know, it, it's tons of real world examples, um, category theory and real life type of stuff. Um, and, um, and she presents it so well, um, you know, illustrating, for example, associativity by saying, you know, the grandmother of my mother is the same as the mother of my grandmother and, and, and so on. And all these nice, nice little examples that are pithy demonstrations of kind of category theoretic uh, foundational concepts. Um, it's the same person, uh, just, you know, it, 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 it's herself uh, earlier in life uh, who gave the catsters. And it was a huge contribution in its time. And, and it still is a great contribution now. Okay. So where am I hoping to, to take this thing? What am, I, what am I hoping to accomplish with these resources to get you started and, and these resources? Well, by the way, there's plenty I didn't put here. I didn't put Azimuth Forum. I didn't put, uh, you know, this, this uh, amazing stuff that's now online at, at uh, NCAT Lab for those who are further along. Um, uh, all the other videos you'll you'll find, but these are the ones I find most useful. And if you were to stuck with those, you could get very very far. What am I seeking to cover though? Between now and May, because in May I'm going to teach a good course, and just as um, um, so Stanislaw Ulam, um, who wrote poetry with mathematical themes, uh, um, wrote. Uh, I have to be. So maybe Stanislaw Lem um, um, wrote um, all vectors dream of matrices and every frustum uh, dreams to become a cone. Um, and uh, it, it, it will be that it's in the nature of things that this discussion group will turn into a course. And it will turn into a course worthy of the name after the snow has melted and after the pandemic has has, has less raging um and um the um uh, th the following are concepts that um uh we're going to cover hopefully before that but then we'll loop back around and cover in that course okay these are um concepts involving uh categories functors and functoriality um and we're going to be talking about covariant functors, contravariant functors, uh, because they are important concepts that even get into object-oriented programming a little bit. Um, you will see those terms come up. Um, uh, and um, we'll be talking about, you know, the, the very useful notions of, of functors in functional programming. Um, 
and how by uh, lifting functions we're illustrating punctoriality, but we'll we'll talk about them um, in broader ways uh, than that. Um, um, natural transformations and natural uh, naturality will also be talked about, and analogizing them to polymorphic functions. Uh, but again, talking about them more generally than that. Now, I'm not going to limit my discussion to programming. And indeed, the main course that's going to be our inspiration did not purely do so. Um, there's, I'm going to be making analogies in system science and other areas. And there's lots of applications of category theories, even covered in this course, I think, um, where you know, even if you have programming in mind, um, we're going to be dealing with many other things besides the category of sets and functions, um, where, where sets are the objects and morphisms between them, these kind of arrows that map one set to the other, are, 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 are functions. That's one category we'll be dealing with, and it's a beautiful category, and it's foundational, um, particularly fin set, finite sets. Um, it, it would be very familiar, but but there's many other categories that we can deal with, like uh, categories related to graphs, where arrows are um, um, relate to whether two things are related, for example, or posets, uh, partially ordered sets, um, where we have um, you know a, a, a link between object A and object B if object A is less than object B, or for the uh, dual category. If, if it's um, greater than or equal to, to be. Um, so uh, we're going to be dealing with postsets and preorders. Uh, they're really useful in computer science, actually. Um, they're also useful in, um, in system science, and, and we're going to be dealing with them, and they're useful as kind of building blocks for understanding higher-level concepts and category theory. We will further be talking about uh, monoids and, and, and um, you know, free monoids, like like you see with uh, appending lists, um, for example, as kind of a canonical example, but also monoids such as involve natural numbers and plus, or 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 um, um, uh, real numbers and uh, and times, for example, um, um, that are uh, that are really um, that are that are useful and. Um, We'll even talk about uh, mon uh, monoids of programming other than the free monoid, um, uh, such as when we do folds of lists, for example, we're applying this monoidal operation, be it plus or times, um, all the way along. Um, and we'll, we'll learn why it's more problematic to, to do with something like minus, because we lose associativity, etc. We will talk about monoidal categories um, and monoidal functors, these functors that respect the monoidal operation. So if you have f of a, if, if you have a times b, if you consider a and b and, and some some category and, and you have a functor that maps them to this other category, f of a and f of b. We, we really like it if, if we have a times b in the original category, if that maps to, you know, so if we have f of a times b, it, it maps to f of a times f of b. Um, that's that's really nice in the other category. There's a homomorphism there. Um, we we get a a, a, a nice um, uh, a nice relationship that's functorial, and uh, we'll be we'll be tapping uh, that notion with, with monoids, because it's there we have this notion of A times B, or A plus B, or A tensor B. Um, and you don't have to get into tensor calculus or, anything, or tensors uh, as mathematical structures. Um, um, we're going to talk about profunctors. Profunctors are awesome. They're often covered later. I'm going to buck tradition, and I'm going to cover them earlier. Because I love them and they're very useful and and I think they're intuitive and and are are uh, are helpful um, really they can start being employed conceptually once you get beyond functors um, you know pro functors and they can actually be useful to understand covariance and contravariance um, in a beautiful way um, pro functors are great 
they allow you to capture kind of the essence of um, composition, bridging things. You're bridging or linking up um, categories. And you reason about them with paths, for example. Um, they can also be quite useful in the context of dynamical systems. Um, and um, and they're very useful, actually, more more deeply when you're dealing with with post sets and um, so partially ordered sets or pre orders and um, and monotone uh, per, monotone preserving um, um, functors uh, involving them. Um, you can have these nice uh, pro functors that emerge. Now they're very general. They apply you all sorts of different places, and it's great. Um, and and at the same time, they're useful. Um, and like so many things in category theory, they're beautiful, useful, general. What's not to like? Um, adjunctions. I'm in love with adjunctions, okay? Um, um, adjunction, adjunctions are awesome. They capture the shared structure between different categories. Um, they capture the fact that we have this sort of common underlying structure that links up these things that are otherwise um, seem like they're, you know, might seem like they're living in, 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 in solitudes in different worlds. Um, so, you know, okay, so you have a plain text domain and you have a cipher text domain. Um, great. But they're not solitudes, right? I mean, like, if there's an operation in the plain text domain, you want there to be a corresponding operation that operates in the ciphertext domain in an FHE concept, uh, context. And so the structure of one, what operations you have, tells you a lot about the structure of the other. But there's this principle of mapping from one way to the other and the other way back. And adjunctions capture that essence. Similarly, if you have a category related to, you know, system dynamics models with stocks and flows and another one for particle versions of those models that's a structured relationship it's not the particle filter model is the sd model it's but it's a close cousin of it. it it's 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 essential features have tremendous amount of common substructure and adjunctions capture this precisely um and and they do so in a way it's extremely powerful and out of them come <laughs> folks Monads and co-monads. Kleisley categories come out of this. Galois connections come out of it. Free monads, because you get free and forgetful functors. It's gorgeous. Adjunctions are fantastic. And adjunctions are what allow us, from a programming perspective, and yes, from a system science perspective, to capture the... Um, capture commonality without boilerplate. So, I mean, this is one of the things, you don't understand how much it troubles me. When I when I take a model, you know, over here, it's, it's a simulation model, and I go build a particle filtered version of it. And what I'm doing, you know, it's, you should be able to, you know, have a child who says, okay, okay, it's got it, this is the recipe. It's kind of like, go figure, you know, you, you kind of map this over in this way, and then you put in a lot of boilerplate that has very straightforward rules. It's just those rules differ based on the, the detail, or sorry, the rules apply in their particulars somewhat different for the different structures, but there's a set of principled relationships. And, and it's like, again, you can read one and know what the other will be, um, and vice versa. Maybe need to specify, for example, when you're mapping a particle filter, you need to specify some additional things involving the likelihood function and involving, you know, issues of, of, of um, uh, what, uh, what you're matching up and um, what empirical series and so on. But the point is there's a structured mapping between them and there's this common substructure and yet we have to put in all this boilerplate. And who has to put it in? Well, the person is speaking to you, of course. I have to put it in. And it, uh, you know, it, it causes me to almost become sick sometimes like this is so so wrong that like like it's a bunch of sound and fury signifying nothing it's just a bunch of cruft that that has to be put in there it's completely predictable 
the fact that I have to spell it out in detail is is almost criminal. Um, well, okay, maybe I, I'm overstating it, but um, you know, it's it's like um, uh, you know, if if I had to um, in order to you know submit my uh, my yearly paperwork to the U of S, um, you know, I had to go translate it by hand into binary or something like that. I mean, I would revolt against it. I would say, like, this is horrible. Like, this is what they developed computers to do, you know? Um, and, um, and so it is with adjunction. It's like adjunctions allow us to specify these structured relations sans boilerplate, without boilerplate, in a principled way that gets to the heart of the matter. And really, that's what category theory is so much about. It's about getting at the heart of the matter, ladies and gentlemen. It's about going beyond the boilerplate. It's about going beyond the cruft. It's about going beyond the, the unnecessary details and getting to the essence of it. Um, I should add that to my, my themes for it. It's about getting to the heart of the matter. That's what category thing gives you. It's, it's a description of the heart of the matter. And everything else can just be automatically explicated uh, in an automated way that doesn't require, you know, human, human, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, dulling human effort. Um, catamorphisms and anamorphisms, or algebras and coalgebras, uh, and catamorphisms and anamorphisms kind of go together. Algebras um, um, will generalize the notion of high school algebra you've seen. <clears throat> With high school algebra, you might have had a polynomial, right? X cubed plus minus 2x uh, plus uh, uh, 3. Um, uh, you know, and, and you, you end up um, evaluating that to get 2 out of it when you plug in x equals whatever. Um, uh, that that's something from high school algebra you're familiar with, and it, it turns out with algebras, you have a type, and let's say, and you have a functor applied to that. Um, f. Maybe that functor is maybe of int. Maybe it's vector of int. Maybe it's you know some uh, uh, some fancier uh, fancier monad like a reader monad or or a a writer, a uh, writer come on that, or, or, or what have you. Um, no, let's not get into come on that. So it'll be for co-algebras. Um, and, um, and so you have that, and you have a function between like, li so let's suppose f is list, right? So f of, of int is like a list of ints. You have a map between list of ints and ints. That's kind of a generalization of algebra. It says, Okay, you have this thing, and you can reduce it to an int. It's like a function here that that is involved um, uh, here uh, in in mapping a particular function um, uh, on this uh, this uh, to to map map in this appropriate way um, the evaluation function, and it reduces it to an int. And so that that's an algebra, and a coalgebra will be the other way. It goes like. Um, a to f of a, so it'd be like into to uh, a list of it, and there you're producing things. Think of like a stream. I'm producing a stream of primes over time. I'm producing these. Um, you want another prime? Here you go, and um, you just keep on producing these primes. Um, um, so coalgebras and algebras um, are kind of abstract concepts, but they're really useful. And, and, at a certain level, you relate them to monads, but they're, they're less constrained than monads. Um, and they're very useful and practical, and we see them all the time. When we do folds, uh, for example, or unfolds on, on uh, operations and function programming. And it turns out that these have relationships when it comes to catamorphisms and anamorphisms that are just gorgeous. Again, getting to the heart of the matter, it allows us to specify takes your breath away when you think about it. It allows us to specify sort of a simple local rule for how we combine one step. So so maybe I want to have the ability to, you know, I, I can have a, a little expression tree. Those who have taken compilers have some sense of it. So I can have, I can have a value int, an int, or I can have a 
plus of internet, right? Or I can have a, um, a, a, a plus of an internet. Um, if I can just specify that rule, um, how to plus incidence, then I can say go figure and basically, okay, now figure out how you do a whole expression tree from that. Given that you know how to do that, now apply it. Now, instead of an int there on either side, int plus int, I can have itself a tree. Um, so I could have, you know, plus of, of, uh, of in parentheses, you know, I could have two plus three and then all added to four. Or I could have two plus three all added to, you know, three plus five, or something like that. And, and basically, just by specifying this local rule of how you add two ints, um, I could say, go figure how you apply it to the whole tree. Or, on the flip side, I can produce, I can produce things. I can have a stream that, given a very local rule, it produces a, a whole stream of Fibonacci numbers, for example. Given the local rule, I just add the last two numbers. Then I, I just explicate it and whoop, I produce all these uh, Fibonacci numbers out, um, or pectorials, or, or whatever other good things. Um, um, think about values of a stock over time or something. Uh, we will talk about limits and co-limits. This is something I, um, you know, I, I find, I think a lot of students find it uh, hard to appreciate. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I really had, should have had a slide on this earlier. I really should have had a slide saying, look, I, I, I said this almost in sotto voce. Um, I, I almost said it sort of I said it as almost an aside, but um, don't get scared by the voices out there that want to explain limits and co-limits um, in purely mathematical terms um, uh, that are unfamiliar to you, like higher level mathematics. Don't, don't worry about that, okay? Um, look for the voices that explain it out there in terms you can understand. And, and really what limits and co-limits are about are universal properties um, that's, in some sense, they summarize things. So look, um, if I have a, a list of numbers, three, five, seven, right? Um, I can ask about a summary of them. I can ask what's its max, right? That's a summary of them. It, it, it's not all that information, three, five, seven, but it, it summarizes kind of a salient piece. Or maybe I could ask for the min, right? Or I could ask for the mean uh, or the median. Um, whatever. Um, it's 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 a, it's a it's a summary measure, and you know, in, in mathematics, those who have gone through real analysis or something might might have encountered it. I'm certainly not going to assume this, but you know, even if you have an infinite list of numbers, you might create a summary of it, like that that um, it's not just the max, but you know, it's it's kind of the asymptote. Maybe you have an infinite sequence of these real numbers that approach one, but the summary of them is one, because no matter how, 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 where you put that limit, there's always going to be one above it, but it's never going to go above one. So, um, so anything below one, there's always going to be one above it. If you pick, you know, no, 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 and I could take the rest of the hour to to continue, um, but there's always going to be something that that gets above that. But if you have one, that's the summary. That's the valid summary of all those infinite number of things. And so we have these sum ways of summarizing even infinite numbers of things um, sometimes. And there's a, these have these um, universal uh, features of kind of summarizing. Um, it's the, the single best way of summarizing. And limits and co-limits provide sort of best ways of summarizing things, okay, of, of, of providing. And it turns out that this may sound really boring because you know you're not used to spending a lot of time maybe thinking about worrying about you know creating limits of, 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 of real numbers or something um, but it turns out this is super practical so when it comes to things like products and co-products disjoint unions of things where you kind of keep track um, it can be an either this is this is either um, or for those south of the border either um, um, of, of, you know, an int or a bool, right? We have a disjoint union. We could have an int, you know, one, three, five, or whatever, or we could have a bool, 
true or false. I mean, it's, which it is will tell us. Um, uh, we'll, we'll say, um, you know, is it the left or the right? Um, maybe it's kind of a degenerate version of this. Um, but um, it's kind of one plus inch, um, where one is 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 a certain terminal category, um, uh, terminal value. Um, so uh, limits uh, in in this context, uh, sorry, um, uh, the coproduct is what's called a colimit, and a product would be a limit. Um, a product is you know we have a tuple, uh, say, uh, or I think in Canada the product pronunciation is tuple, but I've, I've never kind of gotten around to that. Sorry, um, uh, a tu tuple, a uh, tuple of A and B. Um, okay, um, it, you know, so you could have a tuple of an int and a, and a bool. Boy, does that sound wrong. Um, uh, so, um, so you have a, you know, a three and a, and a, and a true, or you have a two and a false, or whatever. Um, it turns out these are limits and colimits. So it's like they're, they're the best way of summarizing that information. Any other way, you can kind of do it as a kludge, right? Like I could summarize any pair as a triple, but, but, oh, come on. I mean, it, it almost makes me, if not sick to my stomach. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's so aesthetically unpleasant. It's unnecessary, right? It involves unnecessary cruft. It involves unnecessary, like, unnecessary information. Um, of the third element, which I, I don't really care about. So products are like, the, the, the pair is like the best way of summarizing two things. And a co-product is, it, it, it can be analogized to that as the best way of sort of keeping track of these uh, these two possibilities. Pullbacks and pushouts are, are probably less familiar terms to you, but they're gonna be useful in a function context. And, and those are also limits. And there's tons of other limits too. Um, uh, we may be talking about limits of cones um, when it comes to uh, uh, certain certain needs. So, um, or, or ends, limits of wedges, and so on. Um, so limits and co-limits, I, you know, I, it's, it's, it's kind of abstract. It can be presented abstractly, but I, I think there's a certain beauty there that I'll try to refer to. Uh, we will further talk about um, monads, well, I said monads, co monads, classing um, categories. I really probably should have put Black's monoid functors next to that. Um, these go by the name of plicatives, I think, in Haskell. Um, and they're actually close cousins of them. They're, um, they're like so many things in category theory, ladies and gentlemen. What we're after. What we're after, ladies and gentlemen, is not equality, it's isomorphism. And, okay, sometimes natural isomorphism, but we'll get to that. Um, it's, um, look, a rose by any other name is just as sweet. What we call the things, whether we call it a set of A, B, and C, or a set of, you know, X, Y, and Z, um, or for that matter, if I could add X, Y, and Z, um, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's it's kind of the essence of it is the same, and from a category theory perspective, um, we're we're it's much more interesting to talk about things up to isomorphism, and it turns out there's always this thing called a skeleton category, which may sound uh, scary. Um, I'm glad I didn't deliver this on Halloween, but um, it um, um, but it basically takes any category with isomorphisms and, and it collapses the isomorphism into a single object. Um, so if you have multiple objects that are isomorphic from a category theory perspective, um, everything else in the category treats them the same. It's like the same people treating other people in the world exactly the same way, we just consider them the same person. It, it, for all intents and purposes, they're the same person. Um, we will consider them the same, um, same, same being. Um, so, um, so uh, applicatives are, are really uh, isomorphic too, and essentially uh, the same as, as lax monoidal functors. Um, we'll talk about algebraic data types as well um, as being inspired. This really, uh, that shouldn't be in the same bullet, and I'm gonna move this over here. Um, I'm gonna exert uh, uh, privilege, and uh, there we go, okay. Um, 
by the way, this is one of the lectures and probably one of the very few lectures I'm probably going to be mostly talking about the slides. I'll probably do most stuff on my whiteboard over here. Um, okay, uh, other things, optics. We will be talking about optics, uh, lenses, prisms, adapters, isos, transformers. We're going to approach this mostly from a profunctor optics perspective, but we'll talk about traditional optics, which are more um, less uh, more awkward because they're not uh, easily composable. Um, and Perfunctor optics have taken the world by storm. They are composable. Um, if I have a way of extracting an A from this structure, um, from structure, you know, larger structure, and then extracting that larger structure from yet another larger structure, I can compose them to extract an A from the, uh, the largest structure. Um, it's beautiful, and you compose them in a not in a functional function uh, function composition way. Um, we'll talk about prisms, um, which are dual to lenses, and in a category theory strict sense. Um, ISOs or adapters, as they're called, uh, which sort of provide ways of twiddling things that are isomorphic to get another equivalent thing. So maybe it goes from a couple of three things to a list of three things and vice versa or um, a tuple that's parenthesized on the left side so a and b and then comma c to something that's uh, a and then b comma c um uh, catamorphisms and anamorphisms and limits and co-limits will will um well uh, i thought i had limits and co-limits so. okay oh i see i see he's moved it um, uh, and then we may talk about uh, Levere theories, um, which are beautiful. Um, they sort of abstract um, the essence of, of all these different structures. Um, so you have the Levere theories for, mona for, for monoids, so different from the Levere theory for, for rings or what have you. Um, we may talk about the Unai dilemma and embedding. Um, probably will end up talking about that. Ends and co-ends are more advanced. They do involve profunctors and we'll be equipped to, to sort of take them on if, if we need to. They also explain some notation. Um, sheaves and, and pre-sheaves and topoi are, um, are challenging. And I, um, I want to be cautious about um, taking those on. Um, I, th I think they're best left to a kind of a second course. Um, there's kind of several levels of abstraction there, and they're fascinating. There's this sub-object classifier, and, but there's all these levels for computer scientists who are not exposed to topological spaces, are not exposed to the notions of matching families, and, and uh, necessarily rigorous Boolean logic, and, and so on. Um, these, these are probably a bridge too far. Um, and um, and then hypergraph categories or operad categories, I doubt we'll get to that in this uh, this discussion group. We may have a continuation in discussion group after the course where we could cover something like that. Those are neat stuff. It's it's great stuff. I, I love topo, um, but but there's a time and place for things, and I I, I don't think that that's something we want to introduce uh, early. Okay, now. Um, I'm going over here, and I, I, I will understand people have to leave. Um, I'm going to actually stop my sharing, and I just want to show you some resources here. I'm going to turn on my video. Uh, I see we've accrued some additional people. Oh, wow. Not only is our number higher, it's the original people plus others. So that's that's great. Um, so no one left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess we're cooking with gas. Um, okay. Um, hopefully... Some of you are still awake, too. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, resources here. There are a couple books I want you to, to know about. Um, so this book, uh, Programming with Categories, is only available here. Okay, um, so you got to get it. I, I don't have a book to show you on the screen. Wish I could. Um, Bartosh's book, I do have this one. There it is. Um, I... Category Theory for Programmers. Um, and uh, this book is available freely online. Uh, 
call me old school, but uh, I like to be able to highlight things. I like to be able to write in the margins. Um, uh, on occasion, maybe I like to put proofs in the margin. Um, but uh, uh, this book is 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 uh, very handy, and it basically captures his blogs over time. It has nice nice illustrations, um, uh, including some of of. Uh, uh, that are quite evocative, and um, I do recommend it. It does have some challenges associated with it, and it has um, uh, it has really uh, good coverage. And, and for me, I, it was worth the book, but um, purchasing it. But um, at the least, I want you to to um, to get an HTML or PDF. It's worth it. Okay. Um, and I think he keeps on updating these ones. Um, uh, over time. Um, now, the other the other resource I want you to to have though is is this this one here. Um, Apply category theory. This is uh, David Spivak and Brennan Fong's uh, uh, next earlier book beyond their the one they're writing with Bartosz right now, which is only partially written. Um, um, so, I sorry, I'm not. Uh, um, th this is the one um, I referred to originally, and their earlier book um, is this one, and it's the one I just showed on the screen. Um, it says Supply Category Theory, Seven Sketches in Compositionality. Okay, that's what we're referring to here. And um, this is a, a very good book. It is a book that, again, helps emphasize many of these things for... Um, modeling applications of category theory. It is dense. It is dense. Um, um, I'm not going to ask you to, to, to you know, read, read all of these books every time for every session, but probably in each session I'll ask you to read some of one book or another, or at least many of the sessions. Um, now there's, there's an earlier book by David Spivak, which I'm going to uh, get down from my category theory shelf which some of you might be interested in as well, uh, category theory for the sciences. And, and, and this also has some good things to recommend it, but it's on the more abstract mathematical side. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's maybe a, a good second book. I have lots of other category theory books if people are interested, uh, including Emily Rial's, which is also worth a note. But um, fundamentally, I, I uh, would recommend that we go mostly with um, this one, I anticipate us drawing heavily on that one. I do anticipate us drawing somewhat on this one, and I do. I will refer to some things from this one. Um, all of them are accessible online, so there's no need for purchases, but you can uh, do so. Um, now, for next time, I would like you to review each of these um, videos. Uh, collectively, there may be three to four hours of video, uh, maybe conceivably a bit more. Um, these are the best, these give for me the best taste of where we're going. This is actually not the first material, this is like where we're going. This is the map from the Shire to Mordor um, and back. Yes, yeah, back, okay. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm setting this off in the wrong way. Um, but um, uh, they're very different. So this is like a six to seven minute introduction by an anonymous person. Um, I'm really curious who it is, but it's really good. Um, and it kind of boils it down into just six to seven minutes. It talks about these concepts. Now, coming out of it, you don't really know what the concepts mean, but you kind of get a flavor of how they fit together and why they build on each other. Um, um, and you get some some whiffs of, of kind of how they play a role. Um, David Spivak's invitation to apply category theory from the apply category theory course this past July um, is a one-hour tutorial where he, fr from the standpoint of an eminent category theorist, applied category theorist, he 
he tries to give a kind of gentle flavor for what category theory is and why it's useful. And, uh, oh, you're not, look at my, oh man, sorry, folks, I should, oh man, here we go. Oh, so, this, this is the first one I spoke about, there's this one, um, uh, Invitation to Applied Category Theory, uh, one hour tutorial linking in um, these many familiar topics. It's, it's great stuff. Um, um, those of you further along, like a Winshou Chayan, you you won't get that much um, maybe out of it, but it's useful how he illustrates it from a teaching perspective. It's very useful. The others will probably get a lot out of it. Um, now, uh, one of my my biggest heroes in all of this is Eugenia Chen, and Eugenia is the concert pianist, um, uh, in-house scholar at Art Institute of Chicago who teaches, amongst other things, category theory to art students in Chicago. Hey folks, if they can do it, you can do it. If they can get over their math fears, you can get through this, okay? Um, um, and uh, it's, it's really worthwhile to watch her videos. She is the creator of the Catsters videos, or many of the Catsters videos, and she is awesome. And you'll find all sorts of TED Talks by or TED Talks by her, all sorts of videos of her talking about math. You'll find her talking at Google and in other other places. She's just wonderful, and she's very articulate. Um, uh, so, she has these two talks. The first of them shows these are quite different talks, despite having I think the same name or at least an isomorphic name. Um, Maybe once is real life or something. Um, <coughs> but the first says uh, shows widespread av uh, applicability of many category theoretic concepts. She's, she's talking about it. She's using many examples that are going to be accessible to everyone here at some level to motivate category theory. And uh, it's wonderful stuff because the examples have to do with, you know, lineages of Roman emperors and, you know, um, um, uh, concepts having to do with number of factorization, simple factorizations, and, and least common denominator and greatest common multiple, um, um, or least common multiple, greatest common denominator, and um, and uh, concepts having to do with um, with ancestry and uh, and relationships and uh, inequities in society and prejudice and. And, and so on. It's, it's amazing stuff, and she really weaves it together well. Uh, she gave that at Lambda World, which is a notable functional programming concept, um, um, functional programming um, uh, conference. Um, and then she gave this other one, which is very different, at uh, the Lambda Jam in Adelaide, I think, um, or Melbourne, Melbourne or Adelaide in, in Australia. And this one's very different. This is more kind of where we're going in more concrete terms about composition, about limits and co-limits, and about, you know, concepts having to do with functors and, 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 and so on. And um, a lot of basic category theoretic concepts she kind of explicates in a way that cuts through a lot of, a lot of kind of jargon and, and and give some motivation along the way. This one will be a lot more challenging, okay? It's going to be hard um, at times because you won't be sure what she's talking about. But she tries to give a flavor of, of even things like natural transformations. You're not going to understand it all. <coughs> That's fine. A lot of people asking the questions are people who have more exposure to category theory than you do. Um, but they'll ask a lot of questions that are uh, maybe will... Um, presage questions you ask, um, um, and uh, maybe they can head off misunderstandings, and it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of fun. So those are Eugenia Chung's videos, and um, they are much recommended. Okay, here we are. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm looking at a crude comments. Um, that old saying about how once you learn what a monad is, you can't teach what a monad is. Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. Um, 
Uh, okay, 11.35, that's like now. Alex, you weren't able to write down all the titles from what? From like this? I'll be providing the slides to you, but... Alex, can you speak up? Yeah. You, 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 had, you had posted something the, in the uh, chat saying, I can't copy down all the titles. Titles for what? Like which slide? These one, okay. I'll be releasing these slides. I will be sending these to you right after this talk. The the slides here, and yeah. Oh no, the videos. By by publicly, uh, by public I mean, I I have no plan to put these on my YouTube channel for you know to get thousands of hits. Uh, this particular video, uh, at least, at least that was my thought. I, 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 you know, um, that was my current thinking. But, um, no, I'll, I'll be sending all these out. And all the videos will certainly be made available to you folks. It's just whether I, I, I have the world, you know, beat a path to the door to hear, hear me um, engage in these utterances, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, but, yeah, all these slides will be available to you. Okay? Okay. Any questions from people, though? Oh, please get GHCI. Please get Haskell onto your computers. Download the Glasgow Haskell compiler, please. So I, I want to use Haskell. And from time to time, we may use Scala, so it wouldn't hurt to have Scala installed as well. Any questions from folks? Um... Yeah, anything relatively recent. I would say the latest stable version <coughs> is probably good. Um, yeah, don't get the development version, which you know, may lead to weird things. Uh, um, uh, other questions? Nothing right now? Okay. So we're going to be meeting weekly for this thing, okay? And and um, that's the plan. I want to do this weekly. And Christine is probably going to not be happy, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. And because um, I will be happy, and and I'm the one who does the work. So um, uh, so we'll get this in there. It's a it's a priority for me. I do want you to to review this stuff and. Um, Again, that can't be all you do, but but review that. What we're going to do starting next time is um, we'll talk about these videos some, and um, and then we will go on, and we'll actually have one or two times viewing the MIT course video just as a refresher on required discrete math, and so we'll talk about functions, and definition of a function. We'll talk some about um, uh, order relations, relations between things, etc. And and just build up some, some basic concepts uh, uh, and and some terminology like about injections and surjections and maybe epimorphisms and monomorphisms and so on that um, we'll be able to draw on uh, subsequently. Um, that's actually not going to be like a, many of those things um, are, are not going to be terribly there's just going to be some things we have to head off confusion points early on. And then we'll, it'll take a couple lectures before we actually define what a category is. Um, and, and that will take us forward. And the way this is going to work is I'm going to watch you, ask you to watch the videos ahead. And then we're going to discuss them. And I will use a whiteboard. And I may, in the fullness of time, use a tablet and write things in various technical or etchings um, through my my little uh, uh, tablet. But in the meantime, I have a whiteboard, uh, sorry, black as a, I am want, um, which I will use uh, to, to illustrate the concepts. Okay? Great. 